Hi Booktube, Erin here, hope you're doing okay. Today, I, for, for Tag Tuesday, I'm going to do the Historathon Middle Ages and Golden Age book tag. This was created by Jack from the Rambling Raconteur and he, he very kindly tagged me uh, when, he, uh, when he made the video. Um, and it's to coincide with the second quarter of Historathon. So this is a reading event that's, that's going on through the entirety of the year. Uh, just encouraging you to read more non-fiction history and in this quarter so from April uh, through to June um, it's, it's concentrating on the years 500 through to 1500 so loosely speaking that's the, the middle ages and for many cultures it was much of a, a golden age so every prompt uh, that Jack's come up with is inspired by a different culture that was I suppose very much thriving in this period so the first prompt is uh, the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, name a book that has a title or first sentence that is a lie, uh, since Holy Roman Empire was not Holy Roman or an empire. Um, and with this one, it's it's not necessarily a lie, uh, but the first sentence is incredibly misleading, and then everywhere it goes from there. Um, it's just nudging your perspective slightly in the wrong direction um, and then by the end you kind of realise what's been happening for the whole book um, and I won't, I won't spoil it um, but that's uh, Chasing Homer by Laszlo Grashman Hawkeye and I, I read this uh, last year and I really quite enjoyed it it's a, a great short absurd novel or, or novelette or Actually, I think it's it's less than 100 pages, so maybe even a, a novella. And I'll, I'll read you a bit from the, the first sentence. Uh, I won't read the whole first sentence since every chapter or, or, or section, whatever he's calling them, um, is its own just long running sentence. So this is how it starts. Killers are on my trail, but not swans. Of course not swans. I've no idea why I said swans, not sheep or doves or a swarm of dragonflies. And I don't care. That's what jumped out, so that's what I keep on saying to myself. Killers, not swans. Something I keep on repeating because at times, rarely, but still, I find myself prone to lapses of attention. Just for a moment or two, that's all. But for that moment or two, my attention wanders. Especially at times when I find a moment's rest on a bus stop bench or mingle among tourists near some fountain. Killers, I'll say, rousing myself, not swans. And it yeah, just keeps on going from there. Um, but it, it, it really is, um, you know, so we've got this character running away from something or, or someone and it, it stays quite mysterious. Um, but really the bigger mystery is actually who this narrator is rather than the situation that this uh, this character has found themselves in. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a great little book. Uh, the second prompt is the Mayans. What is your favourite month of the re uh, month of the year for reading? And I'll, I'll echo uh, Jack on this, actually. Uh, he said December. Um, and I think it, it's the same for me. Um, I, I think I do prefer reading in, in winter, although I, I do quite enjoy reading outdoors. Um, like in the garden or um, just on a, on a park bench or something when the weather's nice uh, at, at any time of year. But um, yeah, certainly December um, when it when it's dark. I think I just like reading when it's dark and there aren't many uh, aren't many people around and it's just quiet and um, yeah, just just turning all the lights off, you know, except for one lamp um, and that's kind of all I need. And there's just something really cosy um, about that feeling. And I, I try to find books that um, kind of echo that feeling, I suppose. That, um, yeah, yeah, that have a kind of warmth to them um, or a kind of depth to them. Um, and it's, there might even be a kind of darkness to it, but it's not utterly bleak. So... This last winter I was reading uh, The Brothers Karamazov and Dubliners um, and yeah, just, just thinking of them, I'm just thinking of all the places I was reading them, visiting families and friends and um, yeah, it just feels really, really nice 
Um, so yeah, I'll, yeah, I haven't changed my mind. I think it's definitely still December. Uh, then the Pala Empire. Name a book or writer that marked the end of an era. Um, this was one that I found quite hard, and there's quite a few more um, in this in this tag that I found hard. Um, but for this one, I, I think I'll go with W. H. Auden. Um, I think he did mark sort of the end of the the modernist era, at least in in poetry. Um, and I, I don't think the modernist era ended that abruptly. I think it slowly kind of faded out. And I think Auden was sort of one of the last poets in, in English to have kind of grown up uh, in that kind of aura and kind of outgrew it or found it a little outmoded. And by the time he died, um, it, it, poetry had definitely moved on um, for, <laughs> for better or worse. Um, and so, yeah, I think I'll go with W. H. Auden um, for the kind of end of modernist poetry, uh, at least in English. Number four, the Vikings. Whose library on Booktube would you like to raid? Uh, there are quite a, quite a few libraries on Booktube I, I'd like to go exploring. Um, but um, I, I've yeah, grouped it down to, um, well, the first one is Jack's actually. Uh, so the rambling raconteur and yeah just you know the background of his videos is so tantalizing he's got some great um nyrb classics and some great everyman's library editions and, and things like that that's yeah just look really really good and um, flossy from the grape jelly library has a great uh, library as well um, and it would be i think it'd be a lot of fun just to root through her shelves and, and see what she's got and matthew from Maybury Book Club as well, just has a great, um, I think quite well curated library. Um, it is certainly very uh, personable. Um, but I, I kind of feel bad, um, you know, stealing books away from a good home. So I think I've made quite a bad book Viking. Um, so I'll, I'll move on. So, so the fifth prompt is the Inca Empire. What work is at the pinnacle of its genre? Um, and since my mind is, is kind of on modernism, uh, I thought I'd go with uh, The Magic Mountain by uh, Thomas Mann. And I don't know, there's something about this. There's, there's a feeling in, in the kind of tone and the kind of breadth of the novel that it gets you thinking that he's trying to include everything that came before modernism and then he's um, kind of churning that into this this, this weird kind of no, um, modernist novel that he's producing um, and it, it doesn't feel at least to me it doesn't feel too alienating or experimental um, but it's not necessarily a straightforward novel um, and and also since we're thinking of pinnacles it, it is set in the, in the Swiss Alps as well um, but it's yeah I think for an example of modernist literature, it's um, yeah, pretty much, at least for the modernist novel, the best that I've read, or at least my favourite. Uh, number six, The Abbasid Caliphate. Uh, who is your favourite writer on science uh, and mathematics, or, or mathematics? And this is one that I really uh, struggled for an answer with, and that's because I don't really read much non-fiction. For, um, for for science or, or mathematics. Uh, until this year, I didn't really read that much uh, non-fiction history either, maybe one or two books a year. Um, and so, yeah, just thinking of maths and, and science, that seems like a whole <laughs> whole world away again. Um, it is something I'd like to read a little more of in, in the future. And actually looking at my shelves at the moment, I don't really have anything. Um, that really covers that kind of thing. The only writer that I can think of that sort of loosely incorporates that kind of thing is uh, Robert McFarlane, and particularly Underland, where he's really thinking about deep time um, and is having conversations with science with them um, with scientists, um, and so it does just offer this different level to the book. It's not just someone walking around and going down into caves and just telling you what he sees and how he feels. 
and um, this is a whole other dimension where he's um, talking with people studying root systems and fungi and people um, in in laboratories under the earth studying dark matter and, and stuff like that that um, is yeah just just sounds it's, it is really really fascinating and um, some of it kind of goes over my head um, but yeah I, I really do need to just remedy uh, the, the lack of mathematics and, and science that I'm including in my reading life because uh, it's, it's, it's certainly a massive blind spot in my reading. Number seven, Byzantium. Name a work you couldn't stop reading uh, despite it being confusing. For this, I, I'd say just anything by W.G. Sebald. Um, he's yeah definitely not a straightforward writer it is hard to say exactly you know what his books are that you know they're kind of presented as novels um, but they're you know they're also travel narratives they're also kind of non-fiction history so um yeah i've got um the rings of saturn here and on the back for the genre it's memoir slash travel slash history um, and so yeah it's just this strange amalgamation um, but there's something I find really infectious to Sebald's writing. I think it's kind of like when you find yourself in a um, in like a Wikipedia rabbit hole where you find a reference and you follow that reference and you just go deeper and deeper and deeper. It feels very much like that when you're reading Sebald. Um, and so for, for me, it, it's like reading a mystery or a thriller, um, only it's not. It's a, a guy just walking around and thinking. Um, but I, I, yeah, so I really love The Ring of Saturn. I've also read Vertigo as well, uh, which is also quite good. Um, not, not quite as good, but yeah, still really quite enjoyable. And I've also got um, Austerlitz, which is just here. Um, so yeah, Austerlitz. This is a, a stone that was living on top. Um, so yeah. He's complicated, but um, just a very infectious writer, I think. Uh, then number eight, the Song Dynasty. What culture from uh, 500 through to 1500 are you interested in learning more about? At the moment, I'm quite intrigued by Japan, um, and particularly medieval Japan. Um, so I've got this. I've got um, some short stories by Akutagawa. Um, which are sort of more sort of um, early 20th century stories. I don't know how far back in time the stories go, um, but he was certainly writing them at, at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and I've got um, Tales of Old Japan, um, sort of collected by A.B. Mitford. Um, and yeah, I mean, this says it, it has folklore, fairy tales, ghost stories and legends of the samurai. Um, but, you know, neither of these are actually history or particularly old works of literature. Um, I have been recommended um, the, the Tales of Genji, um, which is, you know, one of the one of the oldest novels that we have. Um, and that's certainly in this period. Um, but, um, yeah, I just don't really know anything and don't really know exactly where to start when, when uh, thinking about medieval Japan. Um, so it's, yeah, something for me to think about. But there again, about this time two years ago, I didn't really know where to start with studying um, or reading about Byzantium. Um, and I've gone through a fair few rabbit holes with Byzantium now. So I'm sure I'll get there with medieval Japan eventually. Then number nine, the, the Mali Empire, name a book that helps readers appreciate the cultural heritage of Africa. Um, and this, this isn't quite a, a blind spot for me, but it's, it's definitely an area that I would like to improve upon and read more in. Um, but I would recommend this. It's a book I haven't finished, but I have enjoyed dipping into in the past. And that's the Penguin Book of Modern African Poetry. Um, and it's grouped by country. So if you want to get a flavour for different writers for different African countries, 
um, and just in short bursts since they're poems I would I would really recommend this uh, I'm trying to remember uh, what country I was focusing on last year I think it was Gambia uh, no it was Ghana that I was I was reading a lot from Ghanan poets for um, uh, an event that Mark from Booktube with Elvis was doing um, but other than that I haven't ventured that much further into it um, but there's, there's quite a good um, quite a good sort of selection and variety uh, in here um, although it's, it's mostly sort of 20th century poetry um, and I think it's all African poets writing in English as well um, but yeah certainly if you haven't really read any African poetry at all it might be something you'd want to consider um, and yeah I think I'm just about ready to try a few other things so if you have any recommendations for um, you know, for books that um, would help me discover more um, from sort of African uh, heritage and culture then yeah please let me know uh, and then number 10 is the uh, oh dear I <laughs> can't I can't quite uh, read my writing here and I can't remember <laughs> the, uh, the culture it's supposed to be the mirror the mirror what is it the Meroningians Meroningians <laughs> oh dear I should have written that a bit better um, what is your favourite pop culture reference to this period? Um, th there are probably a few that I could have chosen, uh, but it got me thinking of uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, of all things. And there's a, there's a bit right at the beginning, uh, just with a reference to um, to Genghis Khan. So I thought I'd read that. And it's the character Prosser, who is the um, sort of heading up all of these demolition men who are about to... Um, knock down Arthur Dent's house. So I'll just read like the paragraph about Prosser. So Mr. L. Prosser was, as they say, only human. In other words, he was a carbon-based bipedal life form uh, descended from an ape. More specifically, he was 40, fat and shabby, and worked for the local council. Curiously enough, though he didn't know it, he was also a direct male line descendant of Genghis Khan, though intervening generations and racial mixing had so juggled his genes they had, no, uh, they had no discernible mongoloid characteristics, and the only vestiges left in Mr. L. Prosser of his mighty ancestry were a pronounced stoutness about the tongue and a predilection for little furry hats. <laughs> so, so there you go. Um, and I don't know, it, it was just one of those things that, like, that doesn't come up in any of the hitchhikers, like, TV shows or films, or I don't think it's in the radio drama either. Um, and I knew all of those before I read the books. And so um, just the fact that that was in there, it just seemed so absurd and, and weird <laughs> the first time I tried to read it um, when I was a kid. So, um, yeah, it, it always just amuses me when I think of that. And there we go. That's the Historathon Middle Ages and Golden Age book tag. Um, I will tag a couple of people. I think a few people have already done this, um, but um, I don't think I've seen David Wiley do this yet. I don't believe so. I'll I'll tag him. I think he's probably been tagged by a few other people. Um, I'll also tag a couple of uh, namesakes or, or near namesakes. Or so I'll tag um, Aaron from uh, Aaron read a book or read a book, and I'll tag Aaron Hook as well. Um, and I'll leave it there for today. Um, but um, yeah, I hope you're having a lovely day where you are. And thank you very much for watching. Bye bye.